Hey, did you know that messers were invented because peasants weren't allowed to carry swords inside of cities? So therefore some enterprising individual invented a knife that's actually as long as a sword. Hello there, Oscar from Virtual Factula here. Today we're going messer myth busting. And that's because there's a lot of different origin stories and explanations of why messers were invented and why they became so popular. And unfortunately, a lot of these explanations are kind of nonsense. So what I'd like to do today is go over some of these explanations and explain why I think they're nonsense and provide a couple of other ones that I think are more plausible. That is definitely not going to be the last word on the origin of the Messer, but I'd like to provide some good information and some good sources for those of you who'd like to do your own research as well. Before we're diving into these explanations, though, let's first have a look at some of the basic information on what is a Messer, where could they be found, and what were they called back in the day. And that's where we really run into our first problem already, because it's really tricky trying to find a good definition of what a Messer is. Better people than I have tried and kind of failed finding a waterproof definition. And, and here's why. Because everyone can tell that this is obviously a messer. But, for instance, what about this thing? Some sort of unholy union between a Katzbalger, a messer, and a side sword. It's got the Katzbalger cross, it's got a messer grip with a scale tang and rivets, and it's got a very long, slender, double-edged blade to it. Is that a messer? I, I really couldn't tell you. And a further problem is that there's such a huge disparity in the sizes and shapes. For instance, look at this picture. These are all, historically speaking, messes. Now, you could argue that nowadays we'd call the left one a Bauernbier and the right one a Kriegsmesser, but this, this distinction did not exist in the medieval mind, really. These were all just long knives. So, to make things a bit easy on ourselves, we can just say a messer is whatever we think is a messer, but there's a couple of very common characteristics to what we think a messer should have, right? One of them is single-edged blade. Could have a slight curve to it, could be straight. Next very important characteristic that I think most messers tend to have is a cross or bolster with a nagel through it, so a rivet that protects the hand. And finally, a very common feature of messers is a skill tang with rivets going through them. Once again, not all messers have all of these features, but the majority tends to do. When it comes to the geographical spread of messer, we find that they can be found in a lot of places in Europe. Of course, obviously, in all the German lands, you have lots of Langes Messer lying around, but you can also find them in Poland, in Bohemia, the south of Scandinavia, the Low Countries, all the way down to the north of France, and of course, in the British Isles. They weren't exactly called the same everywhere, though. In German, of course, we have Langes Messer and the shorthand Messer being used a lot. I'm not really that confident in, and well read in uh, Middle European sources, so I wouldn't know what they were called exactly uh, in that area back in the Middle Ages although the term Tassak comes to mind quite often. In the western part of this area we find in Middle Dutch, for instance, mess, long mess, or even nagel mess, which you can also find in French, couteau à clou, which pretty means, uh, much means a nail knife or rivet knife. And finally, in England, you find the term hanger being used quite often, although those aren't necessarily always messes by our modern definition. However, we still need to also address the elephant in the room, because what's the difference between a uh, Lagos Mesa and a Falchion? Now, to our modern mind, this difference is pretty clear. A Falchion is, does have a sword hilt, um, and a Mesa has got a knife hilt with a nail going through it. Unfortunately, there's, of course, always originals that defy this, this data distinction, and to make matters worse, people in the Middle Ages didn't also adhere to these differences that strongly, so I wouldn't be that confident uh, saying that if a source speaks about a uh, Falchion or a Fanson or Malchus to say that they don't actually mean a Messer and the other way around. It's really hard to tell, so you have to be quite careful with that in the sources. And, and finally, what about the Messers that we see in the fencing manuals, because I guess those are most relevant to us. And thankfully there's a little bit more uniformity going on there and the shapes still tend to vary wildly, comparing Lekus Nurem's Codex Wallerstein, for instance, but the length is a lot more uh, in the same ballpark. Generally, the blade length uh, is, is roughly equal to the arm length of a fencer holding it, 
So we tend to end up with a total length generally of about between 75 and 85 centimeters, depending on how long you are yourself. While I was editing this video, uh, Bastian Koppenhofer published a really good and interesting article on the HEMA is OK blog. Um, I've linked it down below. And one of the things he found is that the Langes Messe that were allowed to be carried in German cities were generally uh, around or below the 60 centimeter mark. And that can mean a couple of things. Either, for instance, the Langes Messe that we see in the fight books are just a bit off and depicted as being too long. Or it could also mean that the fight books were not necessarily meant for purely self-defense, but uh, it would be able to be used by when someone was on duty in a city watch, when longer weapons that were often associated with war were allowed to be carried. Or it could even mean that fencing, uh, according to fight books, was already considered to be a martial sport back in the time, and not necessarily meant just for self-defense. So now that we've got that out of the way, let's move on to theories on why the Messer was invented and why it became so popular. There's roughly four ones that I'd like to talk about today, and the first one is the most common one. It's this idea that it was illegal to carry a sword inside a city, and therefore some enterprising individual invented a knife that was as long as a sword and could be used like one. The second one kind of looks like it. It's that uh, commoners, and specifically peasants, were forbidden from owning a sword, and therefore, some enterprising individual invented a knife that is as long as a sword and can be used as one. And then the third one, this is given a lot of credence nowadays, uh, but it has some problems, um, is the guild hypothesis. The idea that, of course, only sword makers guilds were allowed to produce swords, and the knife makers were jealous of that, they wanted a piece of the sword market, so they decided to invent a knife that is as long as a sword and can be used like one. There is a fourth theory, which is more of a collection of wild ideas that someone should really look into further, that i just like to present to you. These ideas mostly have something to do with the production process, though. Let's get started. The first urban myth. And that's, of course, that it was illegal to carry a sword inside a city, therefore missiles were invented. We've got to ask, really, was it illegal to actually carry a sword inside a city? And first, let's look at some evidence in favor. You'll find plenty of medieval cities where it was indeed illegal to carry a sword openly in a city. Of course, almost every citizen was obliged to own a sword in case they needed it for uh, defense of the city, but open carry was prohibited in a lot of places. Specifically in low countries, uh, a lot of towns quite actively prohibit the open carry of swords to prevent factional uh, and family feuds from uh, erupting in the city. Quite an interesting detail is that a lot of cities also had a so-called schreef, um, and you couldn't go over the schreef, as the Dutch proverb uh, says, which means that if you owned a sword or a knife that was longer than the um, example knives that were hung off the city gates, you'd have to leave it at the gate uh, before you were allowed to actually and enter the city. This does imply that carrying swords in the countryside was perfectly fine, but just not walk around with them in the city. Now, so far it looks good for this theory, but there's a couple of details that will completely sweep it away. Um, one of them is that it wasn't just swords that were prohibited in these uh, cities in Holland and Zeeland, but it was pretty much every weapon. At the same time, when swords were being prohibited, long knives and nail knives, along with fontsonen, uh, basilars, and pretty much every other weapon imaginable was outlawed. You were just not supposed to be out with weapons in general, period. At the same time, cities that do not necessarily outlaw swords tend to have very liberal weapons policies. A 16th century Italian diplomat in Antwerpen wrote home to his father that it was an absolute great city. He could even walk the streets with a serpentine cannon and no one would bat an eyelid. Now this is an extreme example of course, but um, if you read The Martial Ethic of Early Modern Germany by Klusty, you'll also find that a lot of German cities had similarly relaxed weapon laws and people were walking around with general sidearms, swords, messes and similar things. Of course weapons of war such as halberds and armor were illegal and you could get fined for wearing those openly and drawing a weapon was a very serious offense but walking around with a simple sidearm was perfectly legal in these cities whether that was a knife or a sword. And another slight edit here. Uh, as Bastian um, did his research on some specific German cities, he did find that uh, 
quite a few of these cities did not really have these liberal weapons laws, but were much more like those in the Low Countries, prohibiting weapons above a certain length. Uh, a nice example here is Köln. Uh, he has the example of Strasbourg as well. And, for instance, at some point in his history, Nuremberg pretty much outlawed the carrying of weapons in its entirety. Now, the second theory has, has something to do with this, uh, the estate or class that someone belonged to. The idea that um, commoners were not allowed to own a sword. I can kind of reconstruct where this idea comes from. For instance, you did have some cities that waived their weapon laws for the nobility in the city. There were some sumptuary laws that dictated what people could own and what they couldn't own based on their social standing. And, of course, there's also the fact that the messer, the long knife, was, was pretty often associated with peasants. It was pretty much a thing like if you slap a messer on someone and give them some shabby clothes and everyone can tell it's a peasant. So this image was used quite frequently. But once you start examining the evidence a bit closely, you also start to find that this theory falls apart really quickly. First off, yes, there were a couple of cities that waived their weapons laws for nobles, but as we've already established, uh, those weapon laws were either outlawing messers alongside with swords or allowing everything, in which case the nobles, um, waiving a weapons law for nobles, would mean that they would be allowed to carry their full panoply, so armor and, and weapons of war with them, if they had a good reason for it. When it comes to sumptuary laws, uh, yes, they were there, but they generally were not that concerned with the, the type of sword or weapon that someone was carrying, and more whether the pommel was actually made of solid gold or whether it was simply just gilded. So we're talking at a whole other level of wealth here. So most sumptuary laws really don't say that peasants aren't allowed to carry sword, at least not the ones that I've looked at. And then finally, yes, peasants are often depicted with messes, but if you go look a bit further, for instance, in these illustrations made by Albert Dürer or uh, illustrations made by Breugel, you also find plenty of peasants who are armed with swords rather than just with knives. And you can glean their peasant status, obviously, from their shabby clothes, but they do have a sword hanging on their belt. So I also think that this myth is pretty busted. Now let's move on to some of the theories I think are a bit more plausible. And the first one of those is the guild hypothesis. The unfortunate thing though is it is really difficult to prove, if not impossible at this point, without doing a full PhD in the subject. However, what we do know is this. Thankfully someone kinda already did a PhD on it. Um, and I'm, I'm talking about this little book, uh, The Messe und Schwert herstellende Gewerbe in Nuremberg, by Kurt Keller, and this is pretty much his doctoral thesis in which he investigates and researches pretty much everything that he can find about the knife and sword making professions in the city of Nuremberg throughout the Middle Ages and early modern period. This does present us with a little bit of a problem though, because it's more what we do know and what's easily accessible is from Nuremberg, and Nuremberg does not have the guild structure that a lot of other cities have. Because Nuremberg is run by a very powerful city council that at some point managed to break the power of guilds. So most of the labor regulations uh, are made by a special committee of the city council. That being said, that special committee pretty much did fulfill the same functions as a guild. So they regulated the production, the quality of production, the education of craftsmen and also their pensions and other social activities surrounding what normally would be a guild. Now, to quickly reiterate the theory and try and fit it into the Nuremberg frame a bit better. So the idea here would be, if this, if this theory would prove to be accurate, that this special committee of the city council uh, would serve to regulate the production of weapons by certain craftsmen. So you'd have certain different crafts. You'd have the messerer, the knife makers, and the schwertfeger, the sword polishers, who would also construct a sword based on half products that they get from other craftsmen. And the idea would be, of course, that the Schwertfeger would only be allowed to make swords and the knife makers would only be allowed to make knives. This being the case, though, the knife makers would probably want a share of the markets for making swords, so they just made really long knives and sold them, in effect, as swords, while still conforming to the regulations set out by the city council. 
it, it's rather difficult to get any conclusive proof from this, uh, especially since I do not have really access to any of the guild charters or, or, or professional charters that were handed out by this committee of city council. So we have to rely on some circumstantial facts to give us an idea of whether this could have been true or not. Uh, the first one is very interesting. Uh, there's just a really huge knife industry in Nuremberg. Uh, we're talking about, um, at its heyday, uh, the knife makers comprising about 25% or sometimes even more of the metal working professions in the city. And the amount of knives being made every year and this, of course, includes utility knives as well as long knives, it could have been sometimes as high as four and a half million a year. These are staggering amounts. The, the number of workshops in the city of Nuremberg is huge. The number of sword makers tend to be rather limited. Um, at any given time, you would not find, have found more than a dozen of them uh, in the city. So there's a huge imbalance between knife makers and sword makers. So it might be that in order to satisfy the demands, the um, knife makers would actually start making knives um, to be able to sell in a market that demands a lot of bladed weapons that are sidearm made. However, that doesn't really explain the full story. Now, thankfully, we also got a couple of fun anecdotes that um, bring this whole situation to life. Might give us some more information. As you can imagine, there was a bit of a rivalry going on between the knife makers and the sword polishers. And in 1501, the city council had to decide in a dispute who was to be given the right to build catabalgers. Now, the reasoning of the city council was as follows. Because a catabalger has a double-edged blade, a sword hilt with leather over it and a pommel, it was of course a sword. And therefore, the sword polishers would be allowed to make catabalgers and the knife makers wouldn't. You can imagine a knife maker trying to skirt the regulations a bit by building a thing like this, for instance. Who knows? A couple of years later, the city council ruled in favour of the knife makers when, during a dispute, they said to the sword polishers that they were only allowed to make swords and that that would include the zweischneidige bietenhandige balger, which is probably a reference to the Schlachtschwert or battle sword that's often associated with the Landsknecht. All of this evidence is circumstantial though unfortunately and it would require a lot of research into other German cities as well as cities in the low countries and everywhere else where messes were commonly used to fully explain their popularity but it does give us an insight in how the legal framework of knife making worked and that the rivalry between sword makers and knife makers definitely was a thing that existed and influenced what they would be making what they were allowed to make really so really, my final verdict on this guild hypothesis is that it's plausible, but would need some more proof. Now for our final theory, I'd like to get back to the profession of the knife makers and their work. Because while the guild hypothesis partially explains why knives look different from actual swords, although it requires more proof, we still do not really know why these things were so widespread and why they were so popular in a way. And some ideas that I have on this might have something to do with the costs um, involved with making Messer. Now, making a Lagas Messer with hand tools is actually a bit easier than making a sword and fitting a sword properly. Um, there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, one is that it's easier to forge a single edge blade than having to forge out both edges quite nicely, nicely. The other is that the assembly process for making a knife is easier because the cross guard does not really have to fit as well uh, because you can just put a rivet through it, a nagel and usually finishing the hilt is also easier on the knife so one would expect that that would bring the cost down a bit an often heard argument here as well is that the knife makers were just uh, um, an autarchical profession meaning that they would make all their materials themselves and assemble it into one knife whereas the sword polishers required a lot of half products to assemble the sword as it were Although, unfortunately, that is not true, because by the 15th century, when, when knives were, long knives were becoming really popular everywhere, the profession of the knife makers was also using a lot of half products. So they would get the blades, they would get the pommels, they would sometimes even get the grip scales and then just assemble it as a knife. So this argument doesn't really hold up. The argument of cost, once again, cannot really be proven. I've tried doing some research in the price of a sword and I could find a couple of really interesting things but the data points were all really spread out all across the map. 
So it really was impossible for me to actually compare the price of a Lamex Messer to the price of a sword. So once again, this would require some more PhD level research. And if you want to go for it, please do. But we can't really be fully sure. Another possible reason having to do with knife makers um, and the Lamex Messer being so popular, especially in treatises, might have to do with the fact that knife makers were in some places responsible for making the practice weapons that were used during a factory. In how far this was actually influential on how popular messers were in general, I don't know. But it might explain why the messer was the general single-handed weapon that we find in a fifth book, and not uh, a general arming sword or a falchion. Quite simply, it was the knife makers who were making the practice tools that were being used during a factory. Might have something to do with it. These are really just a bunch of somewhat plausible ideas that really need some more research. So I can't say myth confirmed or anything, this still is only plausible. But at least it's an interesting starting point to continue the investigation from, right? So now we've come to the end of the video. Can we actually positively say that three of these theories that I talked about are absolute nonsense and one of them is fully correct? Well, no. Never works like that, does it? However, we did manage to address some of the myths and bust some of them, and we had a look at some of the more interesting ideas that could at least warrant some further research. So please do not hesitate to refer people to this video, and specifically the list of sources that I provided below, if anyone was interested in continuing the investigation and looking up stuff for themselves. Anyway, I hope you did enjoy the video. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe and leave a comment. I will be happy to answer some questions as well. And finally, thanks again to my patrons who not only provided me with some means to keep making videos, but also had really interesting feedback and input on some of the ideas that I posted a few weeks back on this particular subject. So, thanks again. Anyway, I'll hope to see you all next time. And until then, cheers.